Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Sulars with another podcast here for the AP World History class. This one's going to be about the Persian Empire. And to start off with, I'd like to talk about how the Persians throughout history have been kind of been given a bad rap by Westerners. In particularly be, uh, because our point of view and our knowledge of the Persians first and foremost came from the Greeks. And the Greeks and the Persians have a long, sordid history with each other, uh, fighting numerous wars, which we're going to investigate in class. And uh, you can kind of see how the Greeks viewed the Persians based on uh, the recent movies, the 300 movies, uh, the 300 Spartans, etc. How the Persians aren't really seen as the nice guys. Um, our job here is to uh, get away from that diff Greek point of view and get to understand the Persians a little better. And the Persians are worth studying because the Persians themselves uh, create a massive empire, as you see on the map here. Uh, and the Persians started out as an Indo-European peoples uh, who were migrating throughout the plains of Central Asia, eventually crossing the Caucasus Mountains, past the Caspian Sea, and settling in the Persian homeland, which is now modern-day Iran. Uh, you can kind of see the connection between Iran, Aryan, um, modern-day Iranians are descendants of the uh, Persian Empire. Uh, either way, the Persians themselves uh, would break out of their homeland and create an empire and expand uh, to the east and to the west, and as you see, uh, create a large uh, empire, the largest empire the world has ever seen up until that point. And the question which we're going to investigate today, today is how did the Persians make it, how did they run it, and how did they keep this empire all together? Well, in making the empire, uh, it, they pretty much followed the same route that many other empires were created, it was via conquest. And the first great conqueror of the Persian Empire was a gentleman by the name of Cyrus, uh, a man who united the Aryan tribes and would found the Persian dynasties and would lead them uh, in conquering the other civilizations around them. Uh, he himself created a uh, very well disciplined and skilled army uh, equipping them with leather armor, uh, with thick boots, they used arrows and short bows and the use of cavalry was innovative uh, by Cyrus the Great. But you know he did things like other conquerors by bashing in the head of his enemies but the thing about Cyrus that separates him from other conquerors is his tolerance. After conquering a people, uh, he basically allowed them to keep their customs and religions. He realized that a uh, conquered people shouldn't be a beaten down people, that they should be able to retain their culture and their civilization, and thus they will respect you uh, even more. And as a result of that, uh, the Greeks respected him. They referred to him as a lawgiver. Uh, and a group that definitely was, uh, respected him uh, were the Jews. Uh, Cyrus the Great um, came in and conquered the city of Babylon, thus freeing about 40,000 Jews who were under the Babylonian captivity in 537. And as a result of that, they returned back to Palestine. They were able to uh, rebuild their city of Jerusalem, rebuild their temple, uh, start practicing their traditional rituals again. And the uh, Jewish Old Testament writings uh, honors uh, Cyrus the Great as a very kind uh, ruler. And uh, Cyrus the Great. Um, kind of sets this precedent for the uh, Persians of how they're going to run their empire, more or less being tolerant of the people in terms of their religion and their culture, uh, as long as they respect the political authority. Well, Cyrus would later die in battle, and his son would take over, a gentleman by the name of Cambyses. Uh, not so kind as his father, was actually a little bit more crueler uh, than his dad was, particularly uh, against the Egyptians. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, it depends on the sources. If you read the Greeks, he's cruel to the Egyptians. But if you read the Egyptians, he was very practical as his father. Uh, either way, he conquers Egypt after a series of bloody battles. Uh, that's all you need to know. He dies by falling off a horse in 521 BCE. Had no son. And so a struggle begins amongst the elites of the Persian armies. And eventually, one of the Persian... Uh, princes by the name of Darius takes over and seizes the throne in 521. Uh, this nobleman uh, of great origin extends the Persian Empire to its uh, furthest extent, uh, expanding it further to the east to the Indus River and in northern India. And at this point under Darius, the Persian Empire uh, roughly covered about 2 million square miles. Um, Darius was known for a lot of uh, unique things and definitely is considered kind of one of the great rulers of the Persian Empire. For the most part, um, he's known for um, building oops, building a variety of things, particularly a canal in Egypt uh, that, as you see here by the map, connected the 
uh, Nile River to the Red Sea. Uh, very important here. He built the central capital of Persepolis, which we're going to look at in a couple minutes. Um, he also establishes the empire's main administrative features, which we're going to investigate a little further. Um, in terms of the Greeks, uh, Darius the Great um, was his armies were defeated in 490 BC in the first Persian Wars, and the force that he sent over to Greece to conquer them was defeated at the Battle of Marathon. Uh, he's also known for uh, introducing the Immortals, an elite bodyguard group of 10,000 soldiers that when one of them died, they would be immediately replaced, so hence their numbers would always uh, stay high. Uh, Darius would be succeeded by a few other rulers uh, of note. Xerxes, the famous ruler of the Second Persian Wars, who led the invasion of Greece for a second time, which also failed. Uh, his uh, The Battle of Thermopylae and Salamis, sort of famous ones, comes out of that, which we're going to talk about in class. Uh, he also finished the construction of Persepolis, the Persian capital. And uh, the other ruler of note is Darius III. Uh, this would be the last Persian emperor. And as you can see by his eyes, he's freaking out because he did battle with Alexander the Great and thus ending the Persian Empire. So to recap, if you look here at the expansion of the Persian Empire, we see that uh, Cyrus did most of the conquering initially. Uh, as spread later on by Cambyses into Egypt and then Darius to the further extent of the empire. But more or less, uh, this is a major empire uh, touching upon three continents, Africa, uh, Asia, and even a little bit of Europe. What ran and exactly kept this Persian empire together? Well, first and foremost, it was the ruler. Uh, particularly the representation of the ruler and the image of rule that was percept, uh, put out there by the Persian kings. Um, the Persian kings and rulers themselves uh, tried to put out an image that was uh, a, a higher and uh, superior than and of all others. If you see in the image here, I believe this is an image of Darius. And if you see here, we have uh, an advisor talking to Darius. And if you notice, he's covering in his mouth. The reason being is that he's covering his mouth not to taint the air in which the Persian king is going to breathe. Uh, thus... Uh, showing that he breathes pure air, you have dirty air or uh, bad breath, and you're not going to infect the ruler himself. So more or less above and uh, beyond others. And a lot of this had to do with image. Uh, and the image was upheld by uh, maintaining the law. The law of the Persian Empire was a law throughout all the lands, and the law of the Persian king had to be followed by all the subjects. And thus, the king had royal judges, uh, who was part of his administration, traveling around the empire, hearing cases, and making sure that the law was being followed. Uh, it's a law that was created to unite the peoples of the empire uh, and to assert Persian dominance. The Persian rulers also bears the will of God. Uh, to a certain extent, Persian rulers like to... Uh, flirt around with the idea of being a god on earth, particularly that worked well with the Egyptians. Uh, but in other parts of the empire, just kind of having the will of God or having the heavens on their side, uh, thus whatever religion that the people believed in, more or less the Persians tried to find a way to fit their king into that religion in order to legitimize their rule amongst the people. Persian kings were also known to travel around with a large entourage. Their entourage included a lot of different people. And uh, Persian kings very often would travel throughout their empire so that the presence of the Persian king can be immediately felt. Uh, in this entourage, you would have the family uh, of, the, of the Persian king and the extended wives and children, etc. Uh, the sons of aristocrats throughout all the Persian empire. Uh, they were basically held as hostages within the entourage of the Persian king so that the... Uh, rulers of different regions, the Pashas, who we'll talk about later, uh, would be on their best behavior. Uh, various noblemen would travel around with his entourage. Uh, a variety of central administrators or government officials would work there. Uh, the royal bodyguard, the 10,000 immortals, would be traveling around with the Persian king. Uh, a lot of uh, slaves, as well as other court uh, people to help with the f cooking, the cleaning, the carrying of tents, the moving of goods from place to place. And um, all these people uh, within the entourage were referred to by the Persian king as my slaves. So more or less, everybody is there to serve the needs of their leader. And the last thing about the image of rule is that the city of Persepolis became ceremonial grounds by which 
people throughout the Persian Empire would offer tribute on a yearly basis to the Persian king. And if you take a look here at some of these uh, graphics and images, uh, if you take a look uh, particularly here, okay, you see a long procession of people uh, walking up these stairs, these stairs leading to the court of the king, uh, which we see here, where the people would bring their uh, tribute. This could be in terms of grain, it could be in terms of food, in terms of riches, whatever it was, they would bring these goods to the Persian king uh, where they would be recept received, uh, they would stay in their royal residences, they would be added to the treasury of their goods, and more or less this tribute bearers uh, during the New Year's festival would be one in which uh, the Persian kings would demand of their subjects. And this approach here, this special event, uh, reinforce the authority of the Persian kings particularly because uh, everybody had to go to the ruler himself and to command such respect uh, shows the extent in which these rulers had over the uh, lands they conquered. Now the second thing which kept this Persian Empire together had to deal with administration and in addition to uh, respecting people's religion uh, the Persian kings realized early on that they needed the help of local elites. So the idea of incorporating them into the system as well at the same time watching over them was very important. And so in doing so, uh, the Persian Empire was divided up amongst 20 provinces. Each of the provinces were run by governors or satraps who basically were mini kings within this greater confederation of, of the Persian Empire. Uh, they had, um, you know, basically, they had their own army, they had their own tax collector in there, but uh, more or less the satraps were independent rulers who gave loyalty to the Persian king as long as they offered a tribute. The Persian military also had a presence throughout the empire, uh, where the Persians would have an army in there just to watch over the satraps. Uh, immortals may be dispersed to different parts of the empire too when needed. Tax collectors from the central court of Persepolis were also sent to these different provinces to keep an eye on them also. And more or less, uh, the eyes and ears of the Persian Empire uh, was through their administrators keeping an eye on the satraps. And obviously, if one of them uh, stepped out of line, uh, if the inspectors who came found that the satrap was uh, basically uh, going against the laws of the Persian king, well, then they could be removed, okay? The rule of the Persian king was absolute. And uh, under satraps, as I said before, uh, people are allowed to practice their own religion, their own language, their own laws, as long as they offered respect uh, to the Persian kings. And so hence, the eyes and ears were very important, the inspectors that the Persian king sent out to each of the provinces. Another thing, too, that's important that kept the empire together was a system of royal roads, which I'm going to talk about here on the next page. Uh, the royal road is uh, an important building project that the Persians put together. It's a system of a road system that connected uh, Persepolis all the way to Sardis uh, in the Asia Minor. And this road was important to connect the empire together. Uh, it's about 1,677 miles in length. Uh, the road itself... Uh, had 111 posts or ready stations spaced about 15 miles apart along the road um, and other roads would branch off of this now this was to uh, act as a information superhighway messengers would travel around these roads from one place to another uh, carrying royal commands uh, armies would use this road to go from one part of the empire to the other it's more or less the link that brought all the provinces together and uh, the relay stations were places for a king's messengers uh, who could cover the length of ro the royal road more or less in seven days. And uh, caravans may take a little longer to travel on it. So this was a huge link not only for administration but also for economics. Uh, it shows the political reach of the empire. And um, Herodotus, the Greek writer, talking about the Persian messengers on the road, had a very famous quote saying that neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. That quote is a quote that our U.S. Post Office likes to use too, uh, more or less to show the importance of taking uh, the message from one place to the other. And so this link uh, definitely was a step in direction of binding and bounding the empire together. That's an important thing, the construction of roads, and we're going to see that kind of commonality when we look at other empires too. 
Now, the third thing which kept the empire together, as you can see uh, by the series of coins on the bottom, is the economics. Uh, economic, the empire was bound together, obviously, by the royal road as merchants and uh, other types of people traveled along the royal road carrying their goods from one place to another. It's a way that the riches of the empire can get back to Persepolis also. Also, the tribute from the provinces, obviously whatever agriculture or economic output they created would go back to the Persian kings. In addition, the Persians introduced coined money. Uh, the concept of coined money uh, was invented in Asia Minor by the Lydians, and the idea of coined money basically is the standard value of currency. Uh, this helps to promote trade, uh, and if everybody's using the same currency, it's going to hold the empire together. Uh, you know, the traditional system economically was bartering and trading. Uh, coin money would be used to replace that, and thus uh, it'd be easier for merchants to travel from place to place with coin money, and thus uh, increasing um, the accumulation of wealth. And so more or less what helped to keep the economy together and going was the use of coin money. Now the last thing is the law, and as I mentioned before, uh, the Persian kings were also known for codifying the laws. Uh, this is very similar to taking the approach that Hammurabi did with the Babylonians, uh, but more or less it was modif laws were, uh, the idea of making laws and codifying local laws uh, would also be modified to follow the imperial model. So basically law from the top down would try to be uh, across the board uh, so that everybody would follow the same law. Now the last unique thing about the Persians that's worth talking about is the faith of Zoroastrianism, the uh, other faith which we have not studied yet. Uh, the motto of Zoroastrianism uh, is good thoughts, good deeds, good words. Uh, Zarathustra, as we see here, was a Persian prophet that, and a religious reformer around 600 BCE who uh, basically developed the faith of itself. And according to the teachings of Zoroastrianism, there are uh, the universe has two um, two two uh, spirits, okay, it's two armies fighting each other in a spiritual world, who are basically fighting for possession of each person's soul. Uh, on the good side, we have Ahura Mazda, the Holy Spirit, uh, who represents the Creator, the Truth, the Light of the world, who promises paradise to those who follows uh, his path. Uh, and then we have Aramin, uh, Ariman, uh, who's the destructive spirit, uh, who is evil, the destructor, one of darkness, and who tries to uh, take all souls into a suffering uh, towards a fiery pit. And uh, these two spiritual armies are fighting for the possessions of every person's soul throughout now until the end of time. And the end of time, uh, good will prevail and eventually. Uh, return the entire world and universe to the pure state of creation as it was in the beginning before the destructor came about. More or less, uh, what you see here is that human souls will be judged uh, based on their actions and their deeds and their life that they live. Those who live a good life will be rewarded. Those who live a bad life will be punished. Uh, more or less, the message of Zoroastrianism is that people can choose their own fate. They have choice in their life and they control their faith. Uh, this w faith would have an influence, obviously, in other faiths, most notably Christianity, particularly of the how of the fiery pits of uh, for evil, thus hell, and then uh, paradise for heaven, for honest and moral people, and so on. Uh, there is a connection there, and I'll leave it at that. But for the most part, Zoroastrianism would be practiced throughout uh, the Persian Empire. Would be an official faith of the Sassanid Empire, Sassanid uh, Empire that will come later on and uh, would extend through here. But for the most part, uh, Zoroastrianism would be a much more of a minor religion, but uh, as you see, has an influence both on Christianity, um, perhaps on Judaism a bit too, and also on Islam, uh, in terms of the idea of paradise and good and evil and so on. So this is the end of this podcast. I hope it was informative. And uh, if I messed anything up, please forgive me. And I'll see you in class and to talk about the Greeks. Thank you.